Loving Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for giving us the privilege of life. And we thank you, Father, for the spiritual blessings that you also give to us. We are grateful, Lord, for the food, the shelter, the clothing, the air we breathe, the water we drink. We do not take these things for granted by any means, but we say may all praise, glory, honor, and adoration be unto your name for these things. Father in heaven, we come to you now and ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit as we prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus and for being citizens of the kingdom of God. We pray that you would equip us with all spiritual blessings, that as we go through the words of this devotion, that you will teach us something more that will make us to become more like our Lord Jesus Christ. Put your words in my mouth, Lord, and grant me of your spirit. Consecrate me to your service for the sake of your children who are listening. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Conflict and Courage, August 1. Sorcery, Ancient and Modern. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. Second Kings chapter 1 verse 16 during his father's reign, Ahaziah had witnessed the wondrous works of the Most High. He had seen the terrible evidences that God had given apostate Israel of the way in which he regards those who set aside the binding claims of his law. Ahaziah had acted as if these awful realities were but idle tales. Instead of humbling his heart before the Lord, he had followed after Baal, and at last he had ventured upon this, his most daring act of impiety. Today, the mysteries of hidden worship are replaced by the secret associations and seances, the obscurities and wonders of spiritistic mediums. The disclosures of these mediums are eagerly received by thousands who refuse to accept light from God's word or through his spirit. The apostles of nearly all forms of spiritism claim to have power to heal, and there are not a few even in this Christian age who go to these healers instead of trusting in the power of the living God and the skill of well-qualified physicians. The king of Israel, turning from God to ask help of the worst enemy of his people, proclaimed to the heathen that he had more confidence in their idols than in the God of heaven. In the same manner do men and women dishonor him when they turn from the source of strength and wisdom to ask help or counsel from the powers of darkness. Those who give themselves up to the sorcery of Satan may boast of great benefits received. But does this prove their cause to be wise or safe? What if life should be prolonged? What if temporal gain should be secured? Will it pay in the end to have disregarded the will of God? All such apparent gain will prove at last an irrecoverable loss. We cannot with impunity break down a single barrier which God has erected to guard his people from Satan's power. Amen. The title of our devotion for today is Sorcery, Ancient and Modern. And we are looking at chapter in the life of the son of Ahab. His name is Isaiah. 
Ahab persisted in sin against God, he did not repent and the Lord determined to put him out of office. The Lord ensured that Ahab died in a war and his son Ahaziah took his place. And the record the Bible has of him is that he continued defiantly in the sin of his father in worshipping Baal. Reading from 2 Kings chapter 1, from verse 1 it says, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. The message of Elijah to these men was carried back to Isaiah. As I inquired of them, wanting to know who was the person that spoke to you, when they described, when they described the person, Isaiah said, "It is Elijah." And he told them, "Go and fetch Elijah for me." The men, some men of fifty, went. Two times they went, and they were destroyed by fire. And the third one came and pleaded with with Elijah, saying, "Please come with me. Don't destroy me." And Elijah went. And when Elijah went to see Ahaziah in verse 15, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus said the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken, and Jehoram reigned in his stead. In the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. And um, so this brings an end to the story of Ahaziah. So, what lesson does the Lord want us to learn from here? We are looking at the lesson of sorcery. Ahaziah sent these men to Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, who was known as the god of healing. This was a god that they believed could give them healing from their diseases. In going to inquire of the god of Ekron, Ahaziah was following the other nations around them, the heathen nations, who consulted demon gods for assistance. You see, anciently, nations like Babylon were champions in the use of sorcery. They practiced divination and depended on the power of their gods to either conquer their enemies or relieve themselves from the oppression of their enemies or from sicknesses. They believed that they could get direction on right decisions to make from these gods. They looked at the sun, the moon and the stars for guidance. This was also sorcery. You see Nebuchadnezzar, that popular great man, great king, used sorcery. The Bible talking about him in the book of Ezekiel 21 says or speaks about how this sorcery was practiced by Nebuchadnezzar and the purpose for which he was using it. It says, For the king of Babylon, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, stood at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. At his right hand was the divination for Jerusalem to appoint captains, to open the mouth in the slaughter, to lift up the voice with shouting, to appoint battering rams against the gates, to cast a mount and to build a fort. And it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight, to them that have sworn oaths, but he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they may be taken. So what is this that Elijah was, um, that Nebuchadnezzar was doing here? What was what is this that Nebuchadnezzar was doing here? This is called, like we saw, divination. It's the same thing as sorcery. How was it practiced? The Bible says he looked in the liver. What does it mean to look in the liver? This is also known as hepatoscopy. It was the examination of an animal's liver, most times using a sheep's liver, when they have 
sacrificed that animal unto their gods and they've taken the carcass they bring out the liver it was done by pagans hidden people and what was the purpose of it there will be a special priest that inspected the shape of the liver and the arrangement and he will use a catalog written down to interpret the prediction based on what he's seen in the liver and then he will say he has arrived at the will of the gods you see in the context in which we read in ezekiel 21 nebuchadnezzar used this practice as a way to know the what action his gods would have him to take whether he would go and conquer babylon um whether he needs to go and conquer israel or to go and conquer another nation he stood at the t-junction like people do today he he made a sacrifice at that t-junction because here the bible says that he stood at the parting of the way you see people today do that where they take sacrifices to junctions to come to t-junctions or four junctions and they believe that in that particular place is where the gods come it happens a lot in africa they come to that junction and they make the sacrifice there believing that the gods come to that place and they are making sacrifices to the gods this is what nebuchadnezzar was doing. it's an old practice it has always been there and he was doing it to get direction or to get power from them you see regardless of what nebuchadnezzar would do though god had already said he was going to destroy judah and that was what he was going to do i mean nebuchadnezzar so it was not his divination that worked it was actually god who was going to destroy Jerusalem. You see, consulting the God of Ekron, like we read concerning Ahaziah, they say he, his own the purpose for which he was doing it was to get healing. He wanted to know whether he would survive. He felt that this God had a power to heal and also knew the future, could tell him, just like King Saul did. And this consulting of the God of Ekron is not limited to seeking healing from false gods. People also seek the God of Ekron to get deliverance from poverty or financial breakthrough, as they call it. You see, the people who do what they call Yahoo Plus today, that is the same thing, the God of Ekron. They sacrifice human beings, take human body parts to these gods so that when they are doing their business or when they want to deceive people or cheat people of their money, that they will be successful. That is the same God of Ekron that people are consulting today. Others do it to get past to be protected from accidents from gunshots and unforeseen events some of them they call it odeshi in the sense that they consult these gods receive power from them and when people shoot them with a gun they believe that the bullet will not enter many times they are sadly terribly disappointed others do it to have power so that they can inflict other people with curses just as balaam tried to do to israel and like nebuchadnezzar some do it to get direction on what to do where to go and in various aspects of life so what are the ways in which sorcery shows itself today today people use mediums like the Ouija boards remember what we read in the devotion it talked about secret societies it says in conflict and courage page 219 paragraph 3 today the mysteries of heathen worship are replaced by the secret associations and seances the obscurities and wonders of spiritistic mediums the disclosures of these mediums are eagerly received by thousands who refuse to accept light from god's word or through his spirit end of quote and what do they do in these secret societies they consult these seances they go they use the huge boards they also use crystal balls they do some palm reading voodoo in what in in, in the Igbo land they call it in si some people call it in yoruba land they call it juju then in jamaica or in haiti they call it obeya or voodoo respectively obeya voodoo is still the same thing practiced in africa still the same thing visiting shrines and priests of other gods and making sacrifices then in europe you have it like the horoscope and reading of the zodiac signs it's all over it's not just in africa horoscope is just taking different forms in different nations is the same sorcery now concerning this matter what did the lord say because the babylonians will look at the stars and that's the horoscope now the zodiac signs to make decisions for themselves if you go to newspapers when i was growing up this newspaper called vanguard when you go to the comic section towards the back there's always by the side of those comics and all those other cartoons all those um, comics that were there just to the left of it there was always that horoscope placed there to draw our attention to it and they divide 
your own prophecy based on the your zodiac sign all those cancer capricorn sagittarius aries pisces and all whatnot and they tell you what your day is going to look like but i thank god my father used to come back in the night with the newspaper and so whatever we read from there is already too late because there's always a direction given to you for every day based on the stars after they've looked at the stars and said oh today for those who are in this particular category if you are capricorn or if you are cancer this is what you are to do avoid going to this place be like this today today is going to be a happy day for you and all of that they tell you what to do. and many people eagerly read these things what does the bible say about this kind of modern day sorcery although it is not modern it has always been there it's just that it's still being practiced but it's now widespread what does the bible have to say about horoscope and the reading of the signs and the stars jeremiah 10 reading from verse 1 first of all says hear ye the word which the lord speaketh unto you o house of israel thus saith the lord learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of the heavens for the heathen are dismayed at them for the customs of the people are vain for one cut at a tree out of the forest the work of the hands of the workman with the axe they deck it with silver and with gold they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not they are upright as the palm tree but speak not they must needs be born because they cannot go be not afraid of them for they cannot do evil neither neither also is it in them to do good so what is the lord saying to us he says the the hidden they look at the signs in the heavens and they are dismayed at them they look at the stars the moon and then they interpret this and that and say oh this is what it is in the cartoons they teach them all these greek cartoons like hercules and also asterix and obelix i remember reading watching that cartoon asterix and obelisk that was where i knew what sorcery was about they always will have sorcerers and they will drink potions and after drinking those potions then they become strong and mighty and able to fight that is what it is today it's still the same just modifying and making paganism and satanic practices become attractive to little children what is the difference between asterix and obelix and what many youths are doing today in going to these demon gods and receiving powers from them so that when they are shot so called the bullets will not enter so that when they use some matchets on them or using some cutlass or knives on them it will not penetrate their body it is the same thing that is done in asterisk and obelisk the same thing no difference whatsoever it is just painted in a more attractive and acceptable garb for little children to accept and not know that they are worshiping demon gods and rejoicing in sorcery every time i hear sorcery what comes to my mind is asterisk and obelisk because that's what it's about and that is the modern day sorcery pushed to the children the lord says do not be dismayed at them and how about the horoscope like we're saying in isaiah 47 reading from verse 12 it's to, speaking about the powerlessness of these things the lord says stand now with thine enchantment and with the multitude of thy sorceries wherein thou hast labored from thy youth if so be thou shalt be able to profit if so be thou mayest prevail the Lord is speaking to those people. Mostly, you see them in the cities, in the villages, all over. It's not just in the villages. They wear rings given to them by these priests saying that they have powers now with the sorcery that they have done. And the Lord is saying, come, since you have labored in this kind of thing from your youth, come, let us see whether it will profit you, whether you will prevail. Verse 13 now says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, that's the people who do the horoscope, that's them, because they do it month by month. The Lord calls them by name, you horoscope readers and writers, stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. These things are powerless. Look at the world around us. With all the power that there claims to be in sorcery and magic, how come they still complain about climate change? I thought they had worshipped the god of thunder and the god of the skies and the god of the waters. Why don't they speak to their gods to remedy these things? 
Look at the bloodshed and killing and sickness is all over. Where is the God of Akron to, re- to heal the people? How come he's not healing them? They are powerless. That's the reason. What was this God of Ekron that Ahaziah wanted to make inquiry from? It was a hidden God that claimed to have power to heal diseases in his sickness. Instead of Ahaziah seeking the God of heaven, he went to a hidden power for healing. The fact he did this shows that he somehow understood his sickness to be spiritual. You know, people talk about it today. This sickness is not normal, it's spiritual. That was what Ahaziah thought too. What are we to do when we are sick without remedy or it seems like we've tried so much and nothing is happening? Do we do like Ahaziah? If we think it was sent like some believe, is that an excuse for us to go to satanic powers for healing? This is no excuse at all. If we do this, we are departing from God and he will cut us off from himself like he did to Ahaziah, like we read in Conflict and Courage, page 219, paragraph 4 says, the apostles of nearly all forms of spiritism claim to have power to heal. And there are not a few, even in this Christian age, who go to these healers instead of trusting in the power of the living God and the skill of well-qualified physicians. End of quote. This is what we should do. Trust in the power of God or in well-qualified physicians. But in reality, people get sicknesses that are unto death, that are painful. What do we do as Christians, as children of God? Do you remember that Satan does have power to inflict sicknesses and diseases? But this is no reason for anyone to go to him for healing. In the book of Job 2, reading from verse 4 to 7, there it says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man had will he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, speaking about Job now, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, hear these words, The Lord said unto Satan, He, that is Job, is in thine hand, but save his life. Now hear. He says, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Wow. Another account of Satan being able to inflict people with diseases is written in the book of Luke 13 verse 16. It says, now here was a woman that was sick that Jesus wanted to heal and the Pharisees were grumbling because it was a Sabbath day and Jesus said, now here is this descendant of Abraham whom Satan has kept in bonds for 18 years. Should she not be released on the Sabbath? My focus here is that Jesus laid the axe to the root and said the cause of the woman's sickness. It was not something that was pathogenic. It was not something that was a lifestyle disease. While we know that there are diseases that are lifestyle diseases like your cancer, high blood pressure, stroke and the rest of them. And there are also diseases that are pathogenic caused by bacteria and all of that and the microorganisms. But then there's still a third cause of disease, Satan. Two times we see it here. Satan inflicted Job with sore boils. There was no drug. There was no scientific thing Job was going to do to heal himself of that disease. Nothing scientific he would do. It was inflicted by Satan. And then there was this woman that was bent for 18 years. She could do nothing about it. It was inflicted by Satan. There's no drug that was going to help her. There was no change of lifestyle that was going to help her. It was satanic. And this is reality. It is not for us now to say which is satanic and which is not because it was Jesus who identified this. Job didn't even know. And for us too, we shouldn't jump into that ship of determining it was sent. It is spiritual. Mm -mm. Too many people do that. We do not know. Don't say what you don't know. Treat it exactly as you should. So how should we treat this? What should we do about it? When we are inflicted with diseases by Satan, are we excused to go and uh, meet Satan to give us healing? What are the implications of turning to these spiritualistic and spiritistic mediums for healing? We read in Conflict and Courage, page 219, paragraph 5, it says, The king of Israel, turning from God to ask help, of the worst enemy of his people proclaimed to the heathen that he had more confidence in their idols than in the God of heaven. In the same manner do men and women dishonor him when they turn from the source of their strength and wisdom to ask help or counsel from the powers of darkness." End of quote. So here is what is going on. It is a matter of loyalty, faithfulness and allegiance. 
Who are you worshipping? It's not about who can heal you. Can the devil take away the sickness? Certainly he can. He was the one who inflicted it. If you go to the God of Ekron, can you get healing? Make no mistake. Yes, you can. Except God interposes. There is indeed power in the devil to inflict with diseases and to also take those diseases away. But what God is concerned about is where is the source of your strength? Who are you worshipping? Because when you receive help from him, you have verily given yourself over to him and it is dangerous for you. What do we read later? Conflict and Courage, page 219, paragraph 6. Those who give themselves up to the sorcery of Satan may boast of great benefits. But does this prove their cause to be wise or safe? What if life should be prolonged? That is, let's say this is, this is, this is, the disease actually goes. What if temporal gain should be secured? Let's say you get some money after you have given yourself over Yahoo Plus and the rest of it. You have actually gained something. You've gained money by listening and getting powers from these gods. Will it pay in the end to have disregarded the will of God? All such apparent gain will prove at last an irrecoverable loss. We cannot with impunity break down a single barrier which God has erected to guard his people from Satan's power. End of quote. Do you hear me? Is the world hearing? Is our Nigerians hearing? Are Africans hearing? Is the world in Europe hearing this? When you go to listen to the God of Ekron in horoscope and the zodiac signs and in palm reading and in using those crystal balls and in using the other methods of voodoo and obeah and juju and insi, all of it, it will prove to be an irrecoverable loss. You may for a moment get what you want. You may get the money. You may get the healing. Your life may be preserved but you have sold your soul to the devil and he will play with you like a plaything. He will do all he can to you. He will take your children from you. He will take your money when he wants to. He will inflict you with more diseases anytime he wants to and you will be coming to him every time to seek his help. That is what he wants. Do not give yourself over to the devil. Why does the Lord permit that his children sometimes are put into this test where he allows like he did to Job the devil to inflict us with diseases and with sicknesses the Lord permits it but I'll tell you why let us read from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13 to understand what the Lord is doing when he permits this Deuteronomy chapter 13 reading from verse 1 says prophets don't don't think that when he says prophets it means God's prophets they are false prophets. Jesus talked about false prophets. So when you hear the word prophet, don't even imagine that it's referring to God's people. No, it isn't. It says, prophets or interpreters of dreams may promise a miracle or a wonder. So let me just stop and explain to you what this means. So someone might come to you and threaten you. I'm going to do this to you. I will do something to you. And the person, like I said, they have power to inflict you with disease or the other. Or it could also be positive they promise you that they are going to give you money they'll give you a sign or a wonder that you are going to prosper it could be positive or negative anyone so it has the meaning of promising you a miracle or a wonder now look at verse 2 it says in order to lead you to worship and serve gods that you have not worshipped before even if what they promise comes true oh my this is where people get it wrong they think that once it comes true it must be of god but it's not so listen to what the lord says even if what they promise comes true do not pay any attention to them the lord your god is using them to test you to see if you love the lord with all your heart follow the lord and honor him obey him and keep his commands worship him and be faithful to him but put to death any interpreters of dreams or prophets that tell you to rebel against the Lord who rescued you from Egypt, where you were slaves. Such people are evil and are trying to lead you away from life that the Lord has commanded you to live. They must be put to death in order to rid yourselves of this evil. Even your brother or your son or your daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend may secretly encourage you to worship other gods gods that you and your ancestors have never worshipped some of them may encourage you to worship the gods of the people who live near you or the gods of those who live far away but do not let any of them persuade you do not even listen to them show them no mercy or pity and do not protect them 
kill them. Be the first to stone them and then let everyone else stone them too. Stone them to death. They tried to lead you away from the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. Then all the people of Israel will hear what happened. They will be afraid and no one will ever do such an evil thing. So what is going on in this abode, in this passage I just read? God determines to set straight in the minds of his people the identifying mark and line of separation and demarcation between himself and other gods, between his people and the people of the world. What is the demarcation? It is this. Miracles and wonders versus the commandments of God. When you read again in Deuteronomy 13 now, reading from verse 4, it talks about the opposition. These people are coming with dreams and miracles and signs. But the main thing I want you to do is keep my commandments. That's what God is saying. Miracles versus the commandments of God. He wants us to see how highly he prizes obedience to his commandments. Like we have been seeing in previous devotions, prosperity comes by righteousness. Prosperity and establishment comes by following the commandments of God. We just saw that in previous devotions. And the Lord wants us to understand that over and over again. He wants us to see that that is what is important. He wants our mind to be impressed deeply with a sense of his abhorrence of those who use miracles as a means to lead us to go away from his commandments. The way the people who do this are treated is to send a deep impression in our minds. That's, you know, God said, stone them. Now, that is to show us a deep impression of how he abhors this and how he utterly rejects anyone who for whatever reason will want to lead us to neglect the commandments of God, especially using signs and wonders. Sometimes you see this done in a way to they come with the signs and wonders. There'll be some bees. Some people believe that when they see bees in their house, it's not everybody who believes it, but there's some people who believe it that when they see a gathering of bees in their house, I see bad women. And to remove it, you have to go and meet the God of Ekron to do that. And there are others who go to inquire of the dead, um, or inquire from the God of Ekron who killed them, or who killed their relative, sorry. Who, they go to inquire from the God of Ekron who killed their relative, or where their sickness came from, and how to get healing from that disease. And others go to inquire from the God of Ekron to get powers to inflict other people with disease. You see, like we saw, Ahaziah, when he went to ask help from the God of Ekron, the worst enemy of God, he proclaimed that he had more confidence in this God than in the God of heaven. And that's what we do when we do the same thing. You see, there is no excuse for anyone to go and meet the God of Ekron to do sorcery. Whether the sickness is one caused by Satan, or we say it was sent, or this sickness is spiritual, we are not excused when we worship Satan. This is what we learn from Deuteronomy 13. God may be testing us. He tested Job. Deuteronomy 13 just told us now that someone may come to you with a sign or a wonder. What is a sign? It may be someone who inflicts your child with disease, or inflicts you with disease, or inflicts your wife or anyone you know with disease. Or it may be somebody who comes to tell you, oh, this your poverty is spiritual. All those things are tests. God wants to see whether you will keep his commandments. I want to take that again in case it didn't sink in. It says that these people will come to lead you to serve other gods. Verse 3 says, do not pay attention to them. The Lord your God is using them to test you, to see if you love the Lord with all your heart. And then you are, you are told, follow the Lord and honor him. Obey and keep his commandments. Worship him and be faithful to him. There is no excuse, like I said. Now, these are, way, these are ways the God of Ekron and sorcery is practiced in the hidden world. But sorcery has gone to a higher level now. And even among Christians and in the church, sorcery is going on. Another way in which this is done is when we go looking for miracles from false prophets and false healers who claim to be worshipping the God of heaven. This is the most subtle and wicked kind of sorcery because the end of this one is eternal death and it is very potent to deceive the very elect. Satan will always want to use signs and wonders to make God's people depart from his law. Of all the books that apply to these last days, the book of Revelation stands at the top of it 
in terms of clear details and events that unfold to the coming of Jesus. In this book, miracles are mentioned three times. But every time it is mentioned, guess what? It is associated with with false prophets. It is not in association with God's people, but in association with false prophets and the beast. Let us look at these passages now. The first one is Revelation 13, reading verse 13 and 14. It says, concerning the beast, which is represented in the, four, the, the Antichrist, it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound of the, by a sword and did live. Another place is mentioned in the book of Revelation 16 verse 14. Let me start from verse 13. He says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And then he says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them unto the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the second time, it is still from the devil. Miracles. The third time is in the book of Revelation 19, verse 19. It says, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army that's against jesus verse 20 now says and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image they both, these boats were cast alive into the lake of burning fire with brimstone. Three times in these last days, when God is talking about these last days, he mentions miracles. But in what context? Deception used by the devil, used by false prophets claiming to be prophets of God to deceive the world. On the other hand, whenever God's people are mentioned, the remnant, the saints of God who will make it to heaven, they are always described in that same book of Revelation as those that keep the commandments of God. And we have three times, this is also mentioned, three times Revelation 12 verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Who was wroth? The dragon. Who was wroth in those miracles again? Revelation chapter 16 reading from verse from verse 13 what did he say unclean spirit out of the mouth of who the dragon what was that thing that came out of his mouth unclean spirit what was he doing walking miracles in verse 14 now this same dragon revelation 12 verse 17 is coming against the woman and the remnant of her seed which is god's people what are they doing are they walking miracles is that what they, it says no it, they, they are described as those that keep the commandments of god revelation 12 verse 17 again in revelation 14 verse 12 god's people are described here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus again in revelation 22 verse 14 those who are these saints and the remnant that make it to the kingdom of god are described it says blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city so here we see it again the commandments of god versus signs and wonders and miracles we saw it in deuteronomy 13 that book deuteronomy 13 is written for these last days the lord said people will come and they will do miracles and show you a sign or a wonder or dreams and it will come to pass it's not a joke here it will happen the miracle the sign the wonder you will see it with your eyes it will happen but then they will want to lead you away from keeping all of God's commandments. You see, while God's people are identified as those who keep the commandments of God in these last days, and they also point to the commandments as their evidence of God's presence in their lives, the false prophets are identified as people who do signs, wonders, and miracles, and seek to make others see them as God's people. Why? Not because they are keeping God's commandments, but because they can do signs and wonders. The Lord has told you, He has warned you, do not use signs, wonders, and miracles to determine who God's people are. You see, the fanatical methods used by some of these false prophets should suffice to irritate reasonable people. Some of them will come and make a lot of noise, jumping and shouting and making great dramatic manifestations in order to make a show of something supernatural. Then they would say to those who they want to give healing, 
I mean, all kinds of things they say that will irritate any reasonable mind. It is because there is no light in them. Okay? Others may not be so crude like what I have just described. They are, these, they, they are men in suits. They are there for more sophisticated people to deceive them. So how do we know that they are false? Because one might say, how about Elijah? Elijah told Naaman to go and dip himself seven times inside the river so that he can get healing. So what am I saying? I mean, they are unconventional methods. So how do we know who is who? How do we know when people are using sorcery and claiming to be children of God? I'll tell you how. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. The Lord has already told us how to identify them to the law and to the testimony. Do you know what the testimony is? The same thing, the law, commandments of God. If they speak listen to what they are saying not what they are doing if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them that is the test miracle is not the test it is the law and the testimony that we will use to determine who is of God Satan can do miracles God's people can do miracles so how do I know who is God's people and who is Satan's people the law and the testimony listen to their teachings check their practices don't be mistaken it is not because they have no power or that the sign or wonder does not work that they are false not at all the dream comes to pass the wonder and sign are true the miracles work but we know that they are false because like the bible says they will lead you away from the commandments of god it is the source of the power that God is interested in. Isaiah was not reproved because there was no healing in the God of Ekron, but because he sought help from one who does not represent God, who is opposed to God, who is the enemy of God, the God of Ekron. We are not to allow ourselves to be misled by those who claim to have the power to dream dreams and have visions and do signs and wonders and miracles. God has already warned us that this is the identifying mark of false prophets. They want to make you believe them by miracles. Those who are after working miracles and wonders will lay aside the law of God. And, the one, and they are the ones referred to in Deuteronomy 13. Behold, God has already warned you of them. Pastors who neglect the plain word of God, claiming to have powers to do wonders and healing, are the modern day gods of Ekron. Whom, who lead us away from worshipping God. God is using these ministers, these GOs to test you. Many will say, ah, after you tell them, the commandment of God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It says, do not commit adultery. It says, do not enter into um, this entertainment industry, watching all these movies. But they will say, pastor is watching it. Pastor is not keeping the Sabbath. Pastor is this. God is using these pastors to test you. I, I must be very plain to you these pastors i'm not mentioning names you identify them by yourself who are going against god's commandments yet claiming to have the power to walk wonders dream dreams see visions and do miracles they are the ones referred to in Deuteronomy 13 that god is using them to test you will you pass your test by neglecting what they are doing and keeping the commandments of god or will you fall for the trap by continuing to follow them and neglecting the commandments of god and waiting for these pastors to tell you to keep it are you waiting for them? The word of God has already spoken. You are not listening. Will you listen? And follow the word of God above the word of these false prophets, these gods of Ekron. The commandments of God is the identifying mark of his people today and forever it has always been. And God will always test us to see whether we'll keep his commandments or not. Reading from Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 49, paragraph 3, it says, We must not trust the claims of men. They may, as Christ presents, profess to work miracles in healing the sick. Is this marvelous? When just behind them stands a great deceiver, the miracle worker who will yet bring down fire from heaven in the sight of men? Nor can we trust impressions, the voice or spirit that says to a man, you are under no obligation to obey the law of God, you are holy and sinless. While he is trampling on the divine law, he is not the voice of Jesus, for he declares, Jesus declares, I have kept my father's commandments, John 15 verse 10, and Jesus testifies, he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him 1 john chapter 2 verse 4 then how can these manifestations of great power and these wonderful impressions be accounted for except on the ground that they are given through the influence of that miracle working spirit that has gone forth to deceive the whole world and infatuate them with strong delusion that they shall believe a lie 
He is pleased when men and women claim to possess great spiritual power and yet disregard the law of God because through their disobedience they mislead others and he can use them as effective agents in his work. None need be deceived. Every one of us will sorely be tempted. Our faith will be tried to the uttermost. Let me pause. Like I said, true sicknesses like that are spiritual like you see. You'll be tested. What do we do? We must have a living connection with God. We must be partakers of the divine nature. Then we shall not be deceived by the devices of the enemy and shall escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. We we need to be anchored in Christ, rooted and grounded in the faith. Satan walks through agents. He selects those who have not been drinking of the living waters, whose souls are at thirst for something new and strange, and who are ever ready to drink at any fountain that may present itself. Voices will be heard, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, there. But we must believe them not. We have unmistakable evidence of the voice of the true shepherd, and he is calling upon us to follow him. He says, I have kept my father's commandments. He leads his sheep in the path of humble obedience to the law of God, but he never encourages them in the transgression of the law. None need be deceived. This paragraph, page 50 paragraph 4 now says, none need be deceived. The law of God is as sacred as his throne, and by it every man who cometh into this world is to be judged. There is no other standard by which to test character. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now shall the case be decided according to the word of God, or shall man's pretensions be credited? Christ says, by their fruits you shall know them. If those through whom cures that like miracles are performed are disposed on account of these manifestations to ex- excuse their neglect of the law of god and continue in disobedience though they have power to any and every extent it does not follow that they have the great power of god on the contrary it is the miracle working power of the great deceiver he is a transgressor of the moral he is a transgressor of the moral law and employs every device that he can muster that he can master to blind men to its true character we are warned that in these last days he will work with signs and lying wonders and he will continue these wonders until the close of probation that he may point to them as evidence that he is an angel of light and not of darkness end of quote my brothers and sisters remember that holy men like David and Asher died of illness. Isaac was blind. Paul also had an ailment with his eyes. Elisha, who was a great miracle worker, healing people, even the well nigh raising the dead, he died of an illness himself. Job, the perfect man, was inflicted with a sore illness. James was beheaded. Jesus was crucified. All the apostles except John all died in a cruel manner under the hands of their enemies. Why am I saying this? They were not delivered from the hands of their enemies. They died. They didn't give up their faith in order to preserve their lives. God left them to die in the hands of wicked people and in the hands of illness. If we think that the hands of our enemies or evil people have inflicted us with disease or with illness, it is not an excuse for us to go to other gods to seek false prophets for healing. God is testing you to see whether you will depart from his commandments or not. This test may even lead to your death. Paul said in the book of Romans 8 verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril or sword? My brothers and sisters, it is better to die of that sickness sent by that enemy, that spiritual illness, than to go to consult other gods to get healing. Jesus died on the hands of the under the hands of his enemies and it was both spiritual and physical if your sickness is spiritual you have Jesus as your example Paul and the apostles died under the hands of their enemies but they did not because of that because of the um, the infliction of their enemies go to other gods 
better to die poor than to consult God, the God of Ekron. Better to die of illness, no matter how painful, than to do sorcery. Better to die hungry than to consult the God of Ekron and get in financial success. Better to be beheaded or burned alive than to consult the God of Ekron. Romans 8 verse 36 to 39, as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Do not let yourself be separated. How are you separated? by allowing sickness or poverty or the desire to protect yourself and live long to take you to other gods to take you to breaking the commandments of god when you do this you have been separated you have allowed your poverty you have allowed your sickness you have allowed your pain to separate you from the love of god this is a message to us and the lord would want us to take note of all of this that when we are also tested we shall stand strong and not fall. As for what to do when we are sick, we can look at that in subsequent devotions. I believe when we look at August 22, Divine Healing, we'll talk about what should we, what we, sh- we can do. Su- suffice to say, like I've said, do not depart from God. No matter what you do, just don't depart from God. Don't break God's commandments. But we'll look in detail as, uh, as to what to do when we are sick in that devotion. Now, all these things were written like we have seen in Romans 15 verse 4. They were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Brothers and sisters, have hope. Have you gone to the God of Ekron? Practice sorcery? The door is open for you to come back. The Lord will receive you. He will forgive you. Whatever you have done to get powers from evil sources, the Lord can protect and receive you back if you renounce those powers. And don't let any person make you think that once you have done it, there's no turning back. That is a lie of the devil. You can turn back. You can give it up. And you can be saved from it. The devil uses lies to threaten people. If you are with God, he will protect you. He will save you. Do not be afraid to come out. Come out from this sorcery. Come out from worshipping other gods. Come out from the pact and covenant you have made with death. The Lord will receive you to himself. Anything that happens to you after that, he may permit you to be tested. Evil things may happen to you. Don't don't look at that as an evidence that you shouldn't have come out. No. Trust in the Lord. No matter what happens to you, sickness, pain, loss of money, poverty, anything that happens, let that not be a reason for you to go back. The Lord Jesus has loved you enough to die on the cross of Calvary for your sins. Let nothing separate you from that love. The Lord will receive you. And if you are being tested right now, I hope you are encouraged not to go and attempt to do those things that you have been told to do in consulting other gods. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, I pray that you bless these words into the minds of all who have listened, that you will help us to keep your commandments no matter the test we pass through. Lord in heaven, I also pray that you forgive us for our sins. In any way we have gone astray in consulting these gods and practicing sorcery and divination and enchantments, forgive us our sins, dear Lord. Amen.